Well, it's good to be back. And, uh, you know, Ross, uh, you gave a great exhortation here about inviting uh, non-Christians to come to our Skeptics Forum. You know, when I was the evangelism minister here in the church uh, full time, I would tell people, if you want your non-Christian friends to come, it's about an eight to one ratio. If you invite eight, on average, one will come. So don't just invite one. <laughs> <coughs> invite many. And if all eight come, I think we can handle that. So that's okay. And uh, Ross, thank you for teaching last week. Well, I was off teaching at another church, and if you weren't here, what Ross did is he put everybody between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> so, all right, that was bad. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was a great analogy that you used, so, so thank you. So, and, uh, you know, that's what gives me the freedom to actually go and speak in other churches, is the fact that we've got such excellent people here uh, that can teach in my stead. So, uh, but uh, we're actually been talking about actually releasing some of the people here to do short classes elsewhere here in the church. Okay. Uh, oh, we need to get this up and running again. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, last week I was speaking in uh, Sarang Church. You say, what kind of church is that? That's a Korean church. And uh, so packed with all these Koreans. And, uh, but what was a real treat for me was a gentleman came up. Uh, he wasn't Korean. There were a few non-Koreans that came. And he said, do you remember me? And I said, no. And he says, well, I met you 25 years ago. <laughs> and uh, it was at a big event in Orange County. He said, well, how many people came? And he says, well, a, a couple of thousand. So he says, I guess that's why he didn't remember me. Uh, but we did talk uh, briefly. And he said, I bought a copy of uh, The Creator in the Cosmos. I said, I spent the next two days reading it. And at the end of that second day, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. So, yeah, and of all the books I've ever produced, it's that one that I've had more people tell me. Uh, that was a key component to their coming to faith in Christ. And I share that, too, because a lot of you, you share your faith, and you don't really get much feedback. And I share this with the younger scientists and theologians at Reasons to Believe, is that... Often, it's one or two decades. I mean, I hear stories all the time now of people who have you know, watched the DVD I did or a book I produced and how that brought them to faith in Christ. But typically, it's something that happened 20, 25 years ago. And so you're going to have to wait 20, 25 years before you start hearing stories of uh, the seeds that you planted and uh, how they brought uh, people to faith in Christ. So persevere. Uh, you will see some of the fruit, and that's the whole point. You're only going to see some of the fruit of your labors in spreading the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. God gives us the privilege of seeing the tip of the iceberg. But realize when you're seeing that tip, there's a huge iceberg below the surface of things you won't see. And I think that's going to consume a lot of our time uh, when we're in the new creation. Uh, just finding out all the people uh, that had an impact in our lives and all the stuff that we weren't aware of. So... Uh, yeah, may that encourage you. And just this past Thursday, I was speaking in a church in the Desert Hot Springs. And uh, what was especially encouraging is when people came up to me, and I re recognized them. They're former members of this class. Uh, I met a half dozen people out there that were members of this class many years ago. And uh, now they're out there in Desert Hot Springs. Yeah, it's a place where I was actually below the average age uh, group there. So uh, it's a retirement community. So I kind of felt quite young there. Uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of our former class members uh, are now out there. So uh, that was uh, fun. And then, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I spent uh, yesterday uh, just going through Joshua Tree uh, National Park. I've been in all the parks, national parks in... Uh, here in California, but it's one park I've never been. Because, you know, it's a little bit out of the way to get to. Uh, but, you know, what was really special is you'll see things there that you won't see anywhere else. I mean, they have unique uh, plants and animals out there. So that was really special. And scenery uh, that you really don't see uh, anywhere else. So, And, you know, just driving to, to this class this morning, realizing God gave us a magnificently beautiful planet. He didn't have to make planet Earth as beautiful and gorgeous as it is, but he did. It's one of the ways he shows his love for us. He says, hey, 
I'm not just going to give you a place to live. I'm not just going to give you a place where you can develop technology and civilization. I'm going to make it really beautiful. As you look at that beauty, uh, hopefully it will remind you of what I've done for you, how much I love you. Yes? When you were there, did you go up to Key's view? I did. Yeah, Key's view is great. Yeah. yeah. And especially with snow on uh, Mount San Gorgonio and on Mount San Jacinto, so I got to see those two peaks uh, from the viewpoint and I looked down in the valley out to the Salton Sea. And it was funny being in that church, they were saying how many of the people in the church are involved in uh, trying to save uh, the Salton Sea and uh, to preserve it like it was in the way it was naturally. And I said, well, you know, are you aware that 120 years ago it didn't exist? Uh, that the lake is actually man-made? You're trying to preserve something that we made? It's accidentally man-made. Yeah, it was accidentally man-made. It was basically a broken uh, uh, you know, water channel that wound up flooding the Salton Sea. But now they're trying to preserve something that they think nature did. No, we did it. So maybe they should just let it dry up again and get it back to its natural state. I don't know. So, but whatever. Hey, uh, I don't think we're ever going to do a reasons to believe cruise on Salton Sea. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be uh, something unusual. Anyway, uh, we're in the book of Isaiah. And if you did not get the study questions we got for the book of Isaiah, uh, I got about 60 of them here. We've been distributing these uh, several hundred at a time. So yeah, maybe if you haven't got them, I'll get, yeah, thank you. Uh, get those uh, distributed, that uh, would be great. And uh, just so that you're aware, what we're doing in the book of Isaiah uh, is not a commentary or a survey of Isaiah. We're simply going through the book of Isaiah and picking up those texts that pertain to science faith issues, and particularly to what it's got to say about uh, the universe. So, and believe it or not, we're still in question number one. Uh, as you can see there, there are 12 questions we're gonna be going through as we go through the uh, uh, book of Isaiah. And the question number one is, what Isaiah passages address the beginning of the universe? And I think what you've got to discover in going through the book of Isaiah, of all the 66 books of the Bible, the book of Isaiah has got the most to say about the beginning of the universe. It's also got the most to say about the expansion <coughs> of the universe. We're going to be getting to that. But yeah, it says more than any other book of the Bible about the beginning of the universe. And it's been my experience in engaging non-Christians. Most non-Christians have no idea that Isaiah says anything about the universe. And so, uh, you know, they basically think, well, it's Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The book of Isaiah goes into detail about exactly what that beginning is. That's kind of what we're going to be doing, is digging out the details and what Isaiah's got to say about the beginning of the universe. What do these passages say about the universe? And what do these passages say about God as a creator? And how can we use these Isaiah texts to persuade people that God exists and the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, authoritative uh, word of God. And if you've been with us for a while, what we've been doing, and incidentally, those of you who have not been with us for a while, we're in the midst of a really, really long study going through the entire Bible and looking at all the texts that pertain to creation, science, faith issues. And yeah, we've made it to the book of Isaiah, so we're actually more than halfway through the Bible. Isn't that exciting? Okay, great. And uh, yeah, the earlier chapters of the Bible actually have a lot more to say, so we're going to be going fairly rapidly uh, through the rest of the Bible. That's a relative statement. Okay. <laughs> uh, but what we did uh, in getting ready for question number one is I had you go through the entire book of Isaiah. And wasn't it fun to actually read through the whole book in 15 minutes in small groups and dig out every text? And so basically, I kind of forced you to do rapid survey reading of the Bible and pick up all the relevant texts. And uh, we wound up with about 31 texts that we thought could be relevant and went through another exercise of actually going through those 31 texts and seeing which ones really are relevant. I'd ask you to be a little bit on the generous side. If there's any doubt about its relevancy, we keep it. 
but if there's no doubt about it being irrelevant, we dropped it, and that reduced us down. Oh, we're still, we keep losing the computer, or the, uh, the ah, I know why. Let me get that back in there. Uh, this cable is a little too heavy, so yeah, if we can get that back on, that would be great, because we're gonna need this. There we go, all right. That's coming, it, it always comes up on this side first. Anyway, these are the texts that we're left with. So you can get an idea, I purposely left blank the ones that we dropped. So on this list you can see that uh, we uh, eliminated a three of the texts, and actually that's the second half, let's go to the first half. So yeah, they got rid of four texts on uh, the first uh, part of the survey, and so this is what we've got left. Now, what I have done is actually write out these remaining texts that pertain to question one. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to actually go through these texts quite rapidly. And so I'm just going to kind of go through them. I'm going to read them to you one at a time, go through them all. But uh, when I finish reading them all, I want to ask you the question, okay, with that quick reading, uh, what do you get right away? in terms of answering the question, what does this say about the beginning of the universe, and what does this say about God uh, as a cosmic uh, creator and beginner? So just focus on those two questions as we rapidly whip through this. And then after we've done the rapid study, we're going to go back to each verse one at a time and try to dig out the details. But yeah, what I just want you to do is listen to these passages and then kind of synthesize what are all these texts saying uh, about the beginning of the universe and what are they telling us about God as a beginner and as a creator. So here we go. Uh, Isaiah 6.3 Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. And Isaiah 14.24 The Lord of hosts is sworn as I have purposed. So will be as I have planned it. So it will happen. And Isaiah 14, 27. The Lord of hosts himself has planned it. Therefore, who can stand in its way? It is his hand that is outstretched. So who can turn it back? And Isaiah 37, 16. The Lord of hosts, God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, <laughs> of all the kingdoms of the earth, you made the heavens and the earth. Now, the next set is basically a set from Isaiah 40 to 48. And as a tip, Isaiah 40 to 48 is kind of those nine chapters of the Bible that really go heavy into who God is and how he creates. So there's going to be a lot of these texts. Beginning with Isaiah 40, verse 5. The glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And Isaiah 40, 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with a span of his hand? Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure? And Isaiah 40, 22. God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Isaiah 40, 26. Look up and see who created these. It's referring to the stars. He brings up the starry host by number. He calls, them, he calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. In Isaiah 40, 28, uh, 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. And Isaiah 41, 4. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, Yahweh, am the first and with the last. I am he. And Isaiah 42, 5. This is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out. Who spread out the earth? All, who comes, all that comes out of it. Who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it? And Isaiah, Isaiah 43, 10 to 11. 
You are my witnesses. This is the Lord's declaration and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. No God was formed before me and there shall be none after me. I am Yahweh. There is no other Savior but me. And Isaiah 43, 13. Also from today on, I am he alone and none can deliver from my hand. I act and who can reverse it? And Isaiah 44, 6. I am the first and I am the last. There is no God but me. And Isaiah 44, 24. I am Yahweh who made everything, who stretched out the heavens by myself, who alone spread out the earth. And then we have Isaiah uh, 45, uh, 5 to 7. I am Yahweh and there is no other. There is no God but me. I will strengthen you, though you do not know me, so that all may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is no one but me. I am Yahweh and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disaster. I, Yahweh, do all these things. And Isaiah 45, 12. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens and I commanded all their hosts. And Isaiah 45, 18. God is the creator of the heavens. He formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. I am Yahweh and there is no other. And Isaiah 45, 21. Who predicted this long ago? Who announced it from ancient times? Was it not I, Yahweh? There is no other God but me, a righteous God and Savior, and there is no one except me. And Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember what happened long ago, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. And Isaiah 48, 12 to 13. Listen to me, Jacob and Israel, the one called by me. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. My own hand founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I summoned them, they stood up together. And Isaiah 50, verse 3. I clothe the heavens with darkness and make sackcloth its covering. <coughs> Isaiah 51, 13. You have forgotten the Lord your maker who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. Isaiah 51, 16. I have put my words in your mouth and covered you in the shadow of my hand in order to plant the heavens, to found the earth, and to say to Zion, you are my people. And Isaiah 64, 8. Yet, Lord, you are the Father, we are the clay, you are our potter, we are all the work of your hands. And lastly, Isaiah 66, 2. My hand made all these things. So they all came into being. This is the Lord's declaration. Okay, before we get into this, a little tip. Collecting all these passages, before we actually begin to you know, write notes and kind of make a study, Read them over, over, and over again. I mean, that's personally how I study these things. Collect the passages, assemble them like this, write them all out, and then just read them over and over again before I make any decisions as to what it's saying. I just read it once, all these texts. But here's how I want to begin. Having read through all these texts, uh, what is the one thing that you hear repeated the most as we go through these texts? Because typically when you see this kind of repetition in a Bible book, it's like, I want you to pay attention to this. This is the most important point. So having gone through all this, what is the thing that you think is repeated more than any other? Wow, look at all the hands here. I am ah, God. I'm glad. I thought all the smart people were over here. <laughs> <laughs> I am God. Okay. Okay, all right. 
And uh, we had three hands up here. So uh, oh, we had four hands, OK. Uh, I'm going to begin on this side of the class. So yes, same one as, same one as him, OK. Yes, same, same one. You two. One God. I'm the first and the last. I'm the first and the last. Stretched out the heavens. Stretched out the heavens. That got repeated a lot. OK, yeah? I'm God, absolutely sovereign. I'm God, absolutely sovereign. I made it. I made it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord's showing different facets of himself. You had a comment? Well, no, just, I agree with them stretched out the heavens. OK, agree with that. Let's go to this side of the class. What do you think? Sinatra song, I did it my way. I did it my way, all right. <laughs> Not sure that's what Frank Sinatra believed, but uh, I like that. Okay, yes, go ahead. No one like me. No one like me. Yeah, so it come to pass. I created. I created. Yeah, I think that's what kind of the thing you see repeated more than anything else is. I did it, and no one else but me did it. I alone did it. Uh, and what he was dealing with was a lot of this pagan theology going on in the nations around Israel at the time, where there was a multiplicity of creators involved. And he says, no, there's only one. No one else was involved in this but me, just one. So Jesus did it, so Jesus was um, the Trinity is real. Yeah. Well, I mean, that kind of brings up... By the way, I'm glad we got two clocks here, and they're actually synchronized. So, uh, and that looks like the same clock that I saw Dave throw in here and it crash into little bits and pieces. So, he was an engineer. He fixed it. He fixed it. All right. Okay. All right. So, uh, time flew, and now it's back up there. Good. Okay. So, but you know, even that kind of theology exists today. Where do you think it exists? In Islam. Islam? Well, Islam does make the point that there's just one creator. But there are other faiths that say there's not just one. There's a bunch. Hinduism. 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 Yeah, I mean, one form of Hinduism is three million people involved in, or three million gods mm -hmm. involved in creation. There's another sect that says it's not just three million, it's 300 million. So that, that's a lot of hands in the pie, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, a lot of forms of Buddhism borrow their cosmology from Hinduism. So that's kind of how Buddhism works. They borrow from several places. I think I was sharing with you when I was in Hong Kong last, I ran into a Buddhist sect who believed in salvation by grace alone and a trinity. But they flatly admitted they just took that straight out of the Bible and Christianity. <laughs> So they say, yeah, we just borrow where we want to borrow. So, But the typically most Buddhist uh, sects will borrow their cosmology from Hinduism. So yeah, again, as a multiplicity. But this is something we're actually going to be looking at in some detail because we see repeated over and over again in the book of Isaiah that God alone does it. One creator. However, uh, you did make the point that it's one creator but three persons. And that's something we're going to see. It's a question we got listed down here. Of all the books of the Bible, the book of Isaiah says more about the doctrine of the Trinity than any other uh, text in the Bible. In fact, one of the exercises I'm going to have you do is go through the book of Isaiah, and you're going to find a text that identifies the Father as the Creator, the Son as the Creator, and the Spirit as the Creator. And yet it says repeatedly in the book of Isaiah, one Creator only. So, there you've got the doctrine of the Trinity. Three persons are involved in creation, but there's only one creator. And God insists, I alone have done it. And so he uses the pronoun on purpose, I, which means that there's a singular God that makes us, and yet three persons are involved. Yes? I know there are somewhere between 12 to 14 <coughs> passages. number of them being in Isaiah, I think it was, that talk about God spreading out the heavens. And being there's so many of them, it sort of mitigates against uh, somebody trying to say, oh, that's just poetic. And I think it's also the verb tense is used that mitigates against it being poetic. You could comment on that. But my question is, in a 
couple of passages here that talk about the stretching out of the heavens, but also the spreading out of the earth. Now, could one, if they want to play devil's advocate, say, hey, spreading out the earth, stretching out the heavens, uh, it, obviously the earth's not expanding. Uh, so therefore, it's more of a poetic or metaphorical kind of statement. How would you respond to that? Well, I would respond to that uh, by pointing out we already read the passages that resolve that question. The question is answered in the very text that we just read. I'm going to throw that back at everybody because he raised a great question. We have eight texts in this book of Isaiah talking about God uh, stretching out the heavens. And we'll spend some time looking at the verb in Hebrew is natah, which actually means expansion. So stretching out is really not the best translation of the term. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it, uh, skeptics have said, well, these are just figures of speech and metaphors. But look how often it's repeated in the book of Isaiah. In fact, we read all of them uh, as we went through this. And so, again, just like the text is repeatedly saying, I alone have created. I'm the only creator of the universe. No one else was involved. And it's repeated so many times, there's no way you can say, well, it's just God speaking metaphorically. Actually, he involved the angels in this too. No, he can't get away with that, given the repetition we see here. And it's not just repetition, it's repeated with different ways of saying it. And so that kind of eliminates the possibility. But I mean, this is simply a figure of speech. You'd expect the repetition uh, to be sustained in the manner in which it's stated. But that's not the way it goes. Yeah, comment. Um, I was talking to a young earth friend about this, and about the stretching um, versus that was more of a metaphor for it being a home, stretching out a tent being a home instead of the expansion of the universe. That's, that's why the repetition is important to drill into our brains that this is our home. Um, yeah. And so I guess that's how he, he defended it. Yeah, and just to be clear, uh, the young earth creationist science leaders that I've engaged, every one of them agrees that these texts are speaking about an expanded universe. They just think it's expanding a lot more rapidly than what I would suggest has been expanding. <laughs> and for a lot longer, or for a lot shorter period of time. So that is standard Young Earth doctrine, that these texts really are speaking about the expansion of the universe. And basically for the same reasons, the fact that here in Isaiah, you see it repeated so many times and using different language. However, uh, John here has raised uh, an interesting question, is that you got one text talking about God stretching out the heavens and spreading out the earth. And clearly the earth isn't expanding. And so how do you deal with this? And I made the comment, there's actually resolution right here in the passages that we've read. Anybody spotted it? Yeah. Can we focus both questions in Isaiah 40.22 and that it uses spread and, uh, uh, and stretch, and it also gives the character of a home, a tent and a curtain? You're on to something. Because, you know, notice in that particular text in Isaiah 42, it contrasts the stretching out the heavens and the spreading of the earth. It's not saying God stretched out uh, the universe and and the earth. It's making a distinction. So there's something distinct about the uh, stretching and the spreading. It's a different verb. It's a different verb, and you're making the point that it's actually focusing on the home. Because actually it talks about how God stretches out the heavens like a tent to make a home for us. And it says to dwell in. To dwell in it. Okay. We read another text that talks about uh, God uh, and the earth and the home aspect. Remember that as we went through it? Was it when you inhabited? Okay. Yeah. Remember Isaiah 45? 17 and 18. What does it say there? Let me pull it back here for you. Yeah, I'm going to have to be faster if I do it this way. Here we go. God is the creator of the heavens. He formed the earth and made it. He established it and he did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. I am, the, uh, I am Yahweh and there is no other. And talks about how God filled the earth with all these forms of life. He did not create it to be empty. 
In fact, that's one thing we noticed as we were going through Joshua Tree National Park yesterday. A lot of it is really dry desert. But if you look carefully, it doesn't look like Mars. There's light everywhere. You just have to look carefully for the light, but you will find it. It's there. And, uh, you know, all different kinds of light are out there. See any tortoises? Uh, we got to see some tortoises, yeah. We got to see some, lots of lizards, of course. <laughs> so, um, and the rock formations. And of course, we saw a lot of human beings on the rocks. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a popular time of year. Yes. So, yes. Uh, Isaiah 49, 13, King James says that uh, God's right hand has, has spanned the heavens. So span is another way yeah. of things stretching out, right? Well, it's a different yeah. verb. Different verb. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. and, you know, it's making the point, notice some of the texts talk about how God made all the stars. That he actually, this is another place. Remember we looked at that passage in uh, the Psalms? where it talks about how God knows the name of every single star. It repeats that claim here, that he knows the name of all the stars. And incidentally, I've run into some skeptics who say, well, it actually says none are missing. But uh, there are stars that have disappeared and have become black holes. Well, I mean, technically they haven't disappeared. They just transformed uh, to become a black hole. And uh, then, then I had another question about the, the sphericity of the Earth, where it says, talks about the circle of the Earth. Yes. Is it a circle or a sphere? Is well, notice that's one of our study questions. We're going to be oh, okay. actually looking at what Isaiah's got to say that will help us to deal with this revival that's going on right now of the flat earthers. <laughs> and you know, yeah, it's incredible that the flat earth stuff is coming back. Uh, and you know, you figure with people flying in airplanes, they'd be able to figure out that, hey, this, this can't be a flat earth. Look out the window. Uh, <laughs> However, you know what they say when you look out the window? Well, yeah, there's air refraction. It makes it look curved. It's really not curved. It's really flat. So, but I've been telling uh, people on my uh, Facebook and Twitter page, what you need to do is fly from north to south. And, you know, I've gone from LAX to Sydney a few times, and I've gone from Cairo uh, down to Johannesburg uh, several times, and sometimes at night, you know the wonderful experiences? You look out the window and watch what happens to Orion. And you get to watch Orion slowly turn and go upside down. All the constellations turn and go upside down. So yeah, if you ever go down to South, South Africa or Australia or New Zealand, look up at the sky, everything's upside down. There really is a down under. So. <laughs> I'll also explain everything is upside down, but the very fact that you can actually see these constellations slowly go from right side up to upside down, that can only happen if the Earth is a sphere. Black it's not going to happen. Huh? All the blood goes in the earth. <laughs> <laughs> Watch your blood go down. <laughs> so, well, gravity uh, uh, helps you there, too. So, yeah, gravity wouldn't work too well on a flat Earth, but. Uh, and you know what? Uh, our bipedalism requires very fine, highly fine-tuned gravity. So I had to tell my sons that when we were watching that movie, uh, Mar The Martian. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way Matt Damon could walk 18 miles on Mars. You, you got the wrong gravity. But you got the wrong gravity on a flat Earth, too. And uh, if you want to be fully bipedal and capable, uh, you need 1G. Having more gravity or less gravity. Yeah, I mean, you, you like to hike. And, uh, you can't hike like we hike if you've got a different gravity. So next time you're going up a steep hill uh, with one of your friends, and you say, gee, I wish the law of gravity wasn't quite as intense as it is. Uh, if it was less intense, you'd be stumbling all over the place. That law of gravity gives you stability. But fortunately, there's not so much gravity that you begin to curse all the weight that's in your pack. Uh, you can actually get up the, the hills. It's optimal. There is no better gravity which means you really don't want to go to another planet. Go to the planet, go to the moon, uh, you're going to have a problem with gravity. And even then, I'm a little bit off track, but uh, I'll get back on track here, is that when you look at how we human beings walk around, it's a miracle that we're able to be as bipedally capable as we are. I mean, you don't think it's a miracle. Take a pen or pencil of your pocket, 
uh, stand it up and see how well it remains stable in a tall uh, position like this. What is it that stops us from being so slim and so tall with just these little tiny feet that we got and we don't fall over? I mean, take anything else. Uh, take a two by four and stand it up. How long is it gonna stay standing an eight foot long two by four? It's gonna fall over. Uh, the slightest breeze will cause it just uh, it puff on a little bit and that two by four will fall over. And yet you can do that with your fellow human beings blow on your uh, a friend, and they're not going to fall over. No matter how hard you blow, it's not going to work. And the fact that we can even walk in a 60 mile an hour wind, we can do that. And yet we can maintain uh, our bipedalism. It's an utter miracle. And I've actually got a team of medical research doctors at Reasons to Believe as part of our uh, visiting scholar program. We're going to actually have them uh, write some long articles on the miracle of human bipedalism, because it is an utter miracle. So for example, you've got a little tiny gyroscope <coughs> in your inner ear. That gyroscope is always running, and that's what helps, it's one of the things that helps us to be able to be stable on two feet. Uh, but there's 300 right. muscles that are well coordinated by your brain that help you maintain stability as you stand on two feet. But yeah, if you don't believe in God, just look at the bipedalism around you. If there was no God, everybody should be on three, four, five, six legs. But we're on two legs, we're tall, we're slim, and yet we're perfectly comfortable walking around. In fact, we're compulsory. Uh, we're less comfortable walking on all fours than we are on two. And so that's the unique thing about human beings. We're not just bipedal. Uh, our anatomy compels us to be bipedal. Okay. Comment in the back and I'll come to you and then we're going to get back to Isaiah. Go ahead. Well, I've heard <coughs> that uh, alleged that some of the people promoting the flat earth idea uh, have part of their agenda to make a mockery of Christianity to show how foolish people are in believing in stupid ideas. And also I was thinking in terms of the, uh, uh, the uh, balance that it might be described instead of a gyroscope as a fluid uh, sensor. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's little uh, fluid ducts in your little tiny channels in your inner ear. And, uh, you know, if you've got an inner ear problem, it does make it more challenging for you to walk. The amazing thing is you can have that gyroscope disturbed in your inner ear and you can still walk, just not as easily. It shows you how much everything else in the body is working together. Go ahead. Could one try to make an argument? Well, if we had grown up, Let's say Mars. I forget what fraction Mars is. It's four tenths. Four tenths? Yeah, its gravity is 40% of ours. Let's say God had created us on a Mars uh, with four tenths gravity. That our bodies appropriately would be created and or adapted to four tenths gravity, not one G. Uh, in other words, there's nothing magical about one G. Or is there? Okay, good question. Is there anything magical about that uh, 1G? Uh, <clears throat> okay, you could design the human body so it would be more capable than it would be uh, at 4 tenths G than it is right now. <coughs> but it will not be as capable as it is at 1G. In other words, in terms of designs, yes, you could design the human body to be more capable 4 tenths G than it is now. Uh, but you're not going to design it to be more capable uh, than our bodies are at 1G. In other words, you will lose some bipedal capability even with an optimized design at, say, 6% gravity or 1G or 2.5 gravity like you get on Jupiter. So, yeah, uh, one of the beautiful things of planet Earth, its surface gravity is 1G, which allows us to be uh, quite uh, bipedal. I mean, we're just hearing in the service how Jesus walked 100 miles uh, to come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And uh, it was a design of the human body and the design of planet Earth that made it possible for him relatively quickly uh, to be able to walk uh, those miles. And he didn't have to ride on a donkey. Uh, you know, he was a strong young man. Uh, 
he wasn't tired. That wasn't the reason why he got on the donkey. Uh, God gave him the right planet and the right kind of uh, anatomy to be able to do that with relative ease. So there is a reason why he exactly came in. Nine, nine. Yeah, there is a reason why he came in on a donkey. But that's another story. Now let's get back to the text here because we got a little bit off track. And say we do have a question on the platter stuff. And uh, John, uh, oh, he, he walked away on us. Yes. Uh, no, there he is at the back there. Um, his, he's right. A lot of people are reviving the young earth doctrine as a way to ridicule Christianity. Uh, wow. Trying to make the claim that uh, the flat earth idea came from scripture. <coughs> There's absolutely no uh, claim or no uh, basis for that claim. I remember debating once the president of the Flat Earth Society kept insisting that the Bible was a flat earth book. And it says there's no evidence that anybody used the Bible to promote a flat earth book. Matter of fact, one of the questions we got here is based on Isaiah. How can we demonstrate from Isaiah that the Bible is actually teaching that the earth is spherical and not flat? So, but of course they go to texts like, well, look at about talking about the four corners of the earth. But uh, guess what? I know Caltech physicists that talk about the four corners of the earth. So, yeah, the Bible sometimes does use metaphors. And I remember talking to one Hebrew scholar. He's making the point, actually, we translate those texts, the four corners of the earth, not the four corners of the earth. And the analogy we're thinking of is the quarters like the quarters of an orange. So they're actually making the point that the metaphor itself is a connoting a sphericity. But back to the beginning. Okay, so I think it's quite well established here as we go through these uh, 25 texts that is really emphasizing how there's just one creator behind all this. It's not multiple creators, it's one creator, in spite of the fact that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we will see as we go through these study questions, all participate in creation. One mind, one purpose, one creation plan, which means we would expect the realm of nature uh, to make consistent sense. And in one sense, that's what God is doing here in Isaiah. He's challenging people. Only I did it. If you want evidence for that, look around you. Does it look like a kludge job done by 15 different creators? That's not how creation looks. It really does look like it's done by one planner, one mind, with one purpose alone. And basically he's challenging them. I want you to discover what that purpose is in the single consistent creation revelation that I've given you. So, yeah, it's not just God's words here in the book of Isaiah. There's plenty of evidence all throughout creation that, hey, there's only one mind uh, behind this whole uh, creation plan. But, again, we got the comment, look how many times it repeats that God not only created the universe, he stretched it out. And how many of these passages talk about the fact that there is a beginning to the universe? And as we go through these texts, is there really any doubt about the emphasis on the fact that there's an actual beginning to the universe? I started it, I created it, I began it. And so, again, something you see about repetition. Whenever you see a particular book of the Bible repeating a point over and over again, it's a clue. This is something important. Listen to it. And it's not repetition like you see uh, in the Quran. By the way, if you've ever read the Quran, I think you'll be just impressed how incredibly repetitious it is. But it's repetitious in a very different way from what you see here. Notice that when you see a topic being brought up again and again in the book of Isaiah, it's brought up again and again in a different way, making a slightly different point. And basically the challenge is put this all together and see exactly what it's saying. So it's not only telling us there's a beginning to the universe, it's a particular kind of beginning to the universe. As you look at the different repetitions to piece it all together, which we'll be doing, we're going to be able to figure that out. You don't see that, for example, in the Quran. It's basically making the same words over and over again. Uh, you know, which is why I kind of put the Quran down after a while, just saying, this is incredibly repetitious. And the other thing that caught me when I was going through the Quran, not only is it incredibly repetitious, there's not a whole lot of content here. It's just making the same statements over and over again. And it's done in a way that's trying to impress me that this is really very spiritual. 
Incidentally, I also see that when I go through the Mormon texts. The Mormon texts read a lot like the Quran, uh, where you actually have these texts going overboard, uh, trying to impress you how great God is. And as you read these Isaiah texts, it's really different from what you see in the Mormon uh, scriptures and what you see in the Islamic scriptures. Yes? You on those passages that talk about God stretching out the universe, is the, is the verb tense critical? Is it, does it sound like the past or the current going, continuing going on? What is the... Yeah, we'll, we'll be looking at that, but uh, for example, I've run into a lot of atheists and debates on university campuses who try to insist all these Isaiah texts about God stretching out the heavens are simply metaphors and figures of speech. However, when you examine them, and this is something someone who's fluent in Hebrew picks up right away, is it's not only putting the claim of the stretching out in a different way in the different texts that address it, it puts the verb in a different verb form in the different texts. And it's actually making the point that God is continuing to control the stretching out of the heavens. So as God involves step by step throughout the entire history of the universe, uh, fine tuning the rate at which it's being expanded. But it's also making the claim that God created the universe with the inherent property that it would expand. And so uh, it uses, uh, uh, verb forms that make the point the expansion was a completed uh, a characteristic of the universe at the very point it was created. And so at the very beginning when God created it, he created it with an endowed property that it would expand from that point forward. So it's God being continually involved and God doing it all at the beginning. And so you actually three, see all three Hebrew verb, verb forms being employed in this concept of the stretching out. Uh, and you know, it's making different theological points with the use of those verbs. But the fact that it's making those different theological points tells you these aren't just mere metaphors. And this isn't just blind repetition. It's making specific points in every passage that it addresses. And we actually see this in all the texts that talk about the beginning of the universe and also about how God says, I alone have done it. When he talks about the fact that he alone has done it, notice the different ways it brings all that out. So, and so that's kind of what we're going to be doing here. So I'm going to take you back through these texts. And let me take you back. And we're going to try to pull this out one at a time. Here we go. So here it talks about holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, his glory fills the whole earth. And uh, there are people who have been looking at this and saying, it's actually making a point that his glory fills everything, no matter where you look. In the heavens, you see God's glory. No matter where you look on the earth, you see God's glory. What kind of point do you think is being made there? A couple of points I think you can draw to this. Yes? Well, one that he wants you to witness character in what he created. Yes, he wants you to see what he has done. And <coughs> that he's the author of everything. He's the author of everything. Do you notice any repetition in this passage? Okay, yeah. All right. <coughs> okay, yeah, the word holy is repeated three times. I think as you go through the book of Isaiah, it's really hard. I mean, just look how frequently it talks about the holiness of God. And notice when it brings up these creation texts, that repeated, in fact, that's probably the most repeated point about God in the entire book of Isaiah, is the holiness of God, how he contrasts his holiness with a lack of holiness and the peoples around the Jewish nation, and he fingers the Jews and says, you're no better. You're not holy either, but I am holy. I'm the only one who is holy. No one is holy uh, but God. But I think what we can discern from this, as we look at God's creation, we should see evidence of his holiness in creation. And we're basically being encouraged to see that. You know, when people ask me to sign uh, the creator in the cosmos, 
I most frequently put Isaiah 97.6 in there. Isaiah 97.6 says, The heavens declare the righteousness of God, and all peoples see his glory. So it's not just that the heavens declare the righteous or the glory of God, it declares his righteousness and his holiness. You so right here in Isaiah 7. 6. Huh? I think you might want to correct that. Not chapter 97. You said 97.6. Isaiah, pardon me, I'm talking oh. about Psalm 97. Did oh, I say Psalm? Isaiah? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. It's Psalm 97, verse 6. Yeah, only Psalms has got more than 97 uh, chapters to it. So thank you for catching that. Yes, Psalm 97, 6. And how often in the Psalms it talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God. But Psalm 97 says the heavens declare the righteousness of God. And here we have in Isaiah 6 this emphasis on holiness being tied in to what God has created. Yeah, John. Well, this, uh, <coughs> this triplicate of holy, I think, Yes. Right. It's, it's, yeah, the repetition is making the point. I am holy. If you want to know what holiness is all about, look at me. Look what I've created. My holiness is uh, seen everywhere you look. Or English, it could be just rendered as uh, holy is the word. Right. Yes. You, can you define holy for us? Okay. Can, he's asked me to define holy. I'm going to throw that back, if you don't mind. Not at you, but the rest of the class. What does the Bible mean, the Old Testament mean, that talks about God being holy? Set apart. Set apart? Well, set apart in the sense that no one else is holy. So that makes a big set apart. But what is holy? Entirely without sin. Entirely without sin. Entirely without fault. Without sin, that's what I'm Yeah. No evil. It's impossible for God to be anything but good. Uh, what you see in the New Testament, uh, only God is good. No one else is good. Only God is perfectly good. Only God is always righteous. Yes? I think within that statement of his characters, not only that it's uh, for a purpose that you can identify as, as, as good, but it's also incredibly complex and just orchestrated <coughs> in his creation. It shows that he is so beyond our... Okay, you're making a good point. God is holy beyond what we can think or imagine. He's super, super holy, as we've heard over here. Uh, so how is this going to be manifested in his creation? Question? Anybody? I'm not putting anybody in the spot, yes. Yeah, and let me extrapolate that and say, is there anything in God's creation that doesn't testify of his holiness? Well, yeah, our sin would, but in terms of what he created. So next time you run into a mosquito, next time you run into an <laughs> ant, next time you run into a beetle, uh, next time uh, you get infected with a virus or a bacteria, uh, realize everything that God created is a testimony of his holiness. Mm -hmm. And look for it. Because, I mean, it's so often that skeptics, for example, we're having a skeptics forum in a few weeks, how pervasive it is among skeptics to think there's all kinds of extraneous stuff in the universe, stuff that fulfills no purpose. It's just there, accidents of evolution. But if we can show, no, there are no accidents, nothing is frivolous, Nothing is extraneous. All of it testifies of God's holiness, of his righteousness, and his character. Every that bit of it. I mean, we kind of saw that, how God fills the earth with all of his life. He didn't create it to be empty. But literally everything is designed to be a testimony to his holiness. Yes? I ask this question not to be contentious, but just, just, just because I'm, I need to wrestle with this myself. Red and tooth and claw. Yeah. Uh, the uh, animals devouring animals. How, how, how do we fit that into? 
Okay, let me throw this back to you because you're a well-educated man. Where did that, that comment come from, red and tooth and claw? Rudyard Kipling? Uh, Tennyson? I was thinking Rudyard Kipling. Yeah, well, I mean, it got repeated. It was okay. very common in uh, British uh, uh, literature, red and tooth and claw. But my point is this. It came from uh, British scholars who had a non-theistic perspective. And so they're kind of promoting the view. Yes, there's stuff in the realm of nature that makes no sense from a divine purpose. But in fact, it does make sense. Red and tooth and claw is basically a reference to the idea if there was a benign creator out there, a creator that was really all-powerful and all-loving, he wouldn't have animals attacking one another, ripping one another to shreds, and uh, you know, causing them to bleed and eating them uh, while they're still alive. In fact, what kind of got that into British society is people going to Africa and watching wild dogs hunt. And uh, you know, how wild dogs will hunt is that they'll surround the, uh, uh, their prey and they actually go for the, uh, the stomach area. And they'll actually start eating the animal while it's still alive. And they just said, that's just so horrible to think about. Uh, how can that befit a God that's all powerful and all loving? Anybody want to answer that one? I've been to Africa. I've seen those wild dogs. And uh, you know what's interesting about the predators? Okay, you've got a comment. I'll let you go. No? Yeah, could take a whack at it. Uh, well, that was essential over the period of life for preparing resources for us as human beings. It's critical that uh, for preparing the resources we need for civilization and technology, God puts a higher value in human life than he does the birds and mammals and puts a higher value in them than he does uh, the cockroaches and the bacteria, the viruses, etc. But how does the red and tooth and claw actually benefit the creatures that are being eaten? Keeps the health. Okay, yeah. I mean, I think what these British academics weren't really appreciating is what life would be like for the herbivores if there weren't predators attacking them and eating them. The death rate would go up, the suffering would go up, and there's actually been plenty of field evidence that tells us what happens when the predators are no longer there uh, to keep things in balance. The other thing you notice, going back to those dogs, the way they're designed, in fact, this is true of all predators, they develop a killing style uh, to minimize the suffering of the prey. Their goal is to spend as little energy as possible in bringing about the death of the prey that they're attacking. And so it's actually quite a compassionate way uh, to hunt and the difference is, we human beings don't hunt like that. Uh, we can hunt any way we want. We can kill any way we want. The non-human predators don't have that luxury. God designed the predator-prey relationships that if the prey are healthy uh, and capable, uh, they're always going to escape. Unless, of course, they're just unwary. But, of course, what's interesting is that how wary uh, the prey, predator prey become when there's predators around. So, and incidentally, I've talked to zoologists who tell me you need the predators to be around in order to get a healthy reproductive cycle. Because if the predators aren't around, they basically stop reproducing. And so in order to keep the reproduction rate up, uh, that's necessary. So, anyway, uh, I know I'm out of time. So if anybody would like more detail on this, look up Wolves and Yellowstone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's our, our local folks example. The beavers completely went extinct in Yellowstone because there was no wolf. So we need to close in prayer. We need to close in prayer. Another place you can look is what happened uh, when they introduced rabbits to Australia. They didn't have a natural predator. And boy, did they cause untold damage until they were able to restore their predator-prey uh, relationships. And so you might not like the coyotes eating your dogs and cats in your neighborhoods, but they do keep the rabbit population down. So, and, and again, notice how efficiently uh, the, uh, they kill and they only go after the weak, the sick, and the dying because it's all they're able to kill. And that's what's, by the way, a really um, uh, incredible uh, piece of evidence in favor of uh, God's uh, creation is that whenever you see a mass speciation event, in the history of the earth, the predator-prey relationships 
are immediately optimized for the benefit of the predators and for the benefit of the prey. There is no time delay in the development of those relationships. They're optimized right away, and you see that repeatedly. And so, yeah, red and tooth and claw, well, that actually is test testimony of a, a loving God basically balancing everything with one important proviso. You don't need to do that if you don't have gravity, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism. But we need those laws in order to have God efficiently remove evil and suffering once and for all. So I'm willing to tolerate a little bit of animal suffering, and that means the end of all the evil and suffering once and for all with the enhancement of our free will. With that, I'll close in prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for putting us on this incredible planet. In the vastness of the universe, there's nowhere else like this planet Earth. And Lord, we thank you for filling it. We thank you for extravagance in creation. And we thank you, Lord, that everywhere you look in creation, as we examine the soil, as we examine the rocks, as we examine the plants, the animals, the bacteria, every bit of it testifies of your holiness, testifies of your righteousness, testifies of your love. And Father, as we go about investigating this book of nature you've given us to read, help us to see your righteousness expressed, your holiness expressed at every event and every component and everything that you created. And Father, I pray that that would humble us before you and help us appreciate just what a great and wonderful holy God you are. And Father, we're especially humbled that you want a relationship with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.